Hey everyone, happy Thursday. I'm Rachel Robillard. And I'm Derek, here to welcome you guys to yet another amazing episode of Sneak Peek. So amazing. So up first we have this. Whoa, episode. whoa, we haven't even played the intro yet. <sighs> That's right, I guess I'm just overly excited to be hosting this week's Sneak Peek. Okay, just roll the intro. Hey, Sneak Peekers, we have a fabulous show for you tonight. Speaking of fabulous, the fabulous Selena is hosting our news desk for the week. Oh my gosh, she is so fabulous. I love her so much. She's definition fabulous. The dictionary should definitely just move Selena next to fabulous. So fabulous. <laughs> so fabulous. We have a extra fabulous segment of news desk this week by the fabulous Selena. Hey Sneak Peekers, it's been another week full of entertainment. Let's kick things off with my favorite gal, Taylor Swift. Monday evening, she made a special phone call to a very special fan. Four-year-old Jalene Salinas got a 20-minute FaceTime call from the Shake It Off singer. She has been battling an aggressive form of terminal brain cancer, and the last item on her bucket list was to dance with T-Swift to her hit single, Shake It Off. After hashtag Jake it off Jalene started trending on Twitter over the weekend, Taylor decided to make the four-year-old's wish come true. You go, Tay. On Wednesday, MTV released the list of 2015 MTV Movie Awards nominees. This year's nominees span from heroic to heartwarming. Guardians of the Galaxy, The Fault in Our Stars, Neighbors, all of these lead the pack with seven nominations each. Tune in April 12th to see who takes home the golden popcorn. And speaking of the film industry, a new third trailer for The Avengers Age of Ultron has been released and finally reveals the vision. Get ready for the return of all your favorites, the Hulk, Captain America, Iron Man, Hawkeye, the Black Widow, and Thor. The action-packed trailer made the Twitterverse spark with excitement, and it definitely got me pumped. As at Caitlin is a cat put it, I'm crying, it's so beautiful. The movie is set for release on May 1st. Moving on to much sadder news, it is the end of Jared Leto's long-haired era. After tweeting out a picture of someone taking scissors to his hair Monday, hearts broke all around the world. The Oscar winner has chopped his luscious locks in order to officially become the Joker in the upcoming Suicide Squad film. The man bun is no more, the beard is no more, but I'm sure that Jared Leto will bring some serious power to his role. Other buzzed about things this week were Justin Bieber's 21st birthday and Baby Northwest's Mastery of the Side Eye. Keep up with the latest entertainment news by following all of our social media accounts and tune in next week to see who tops entertainment headlines. Well, that's all from the news desk for this week. Back to you, Rachel and Derek. Thanks, Selena. We have so many important things going on in entertainment news. Seriously, it's kind of hard to keep up. I know, with South by Southwest just around the corner, I don't know how I'm gonna keep up and keep everything straight. Maybe we should just review last year's South by Southwest interviews, that way we can mentally prepare and have a Bring It Back Thursday. Well, it's, it's Throwback Thursday. That's what I said. Sure, Derek, well, just, just roll the tapes. Who got there, sweetie? Is that a balloon? That's not a balloon! Oh, Jesus! <laughs> oh, no! oh, no! Can you guys tell us a little bit about your characters that you play in the movie? Yeah, I play, uh, I play Pete, uh, who's the vice president to Zach's president, and I'm like the slightly more nice, smarter, uh, I have more morals than Zach, but I'm pretty much the same character as Zach, but just with more morals, yeah. And I play Scooney, who uh, is literally only in the movie to show off a giant penis. Yeah. I know you direct, you write and produce. Which of the three or you know, many talents and hats that you put on, which do you enjoy doing the most? Uh, I enjoy writing the most, I think. Producing's the hardest and directing is kind of like, directing's the most fun, but you can only do so much. Like you can't direct like three movies a year, but I can write every day and love it. So I, I'm going writing. 
And James, you got your full first like producing scent on This Is The End, right? That's right, yeah. That's um, so how's that journey been for you up to this point, now that you're a full producer again on this great. one? I got a chance to, um, you know, just kind of come up with Seth and Evan, and we kind of have been able to build, like, our own company and our own, like, brand of stuff that we're doing. And it's really, it's, that part is probably very, the most satisfying is that we now have our own stable of projects, people that we get to work with. It's been pretty awesome. I'm very lucky, actually. Uh, you play a father in the, in the movie, right? Um, did you pick up any parenting tips for the future? That's a good question. Not really, honestly. Just We're, don't live next to a frat. Don't live next to a frat house, yeah. And accept that your life is over and it's never going to be what it was. Um, so you did high school, you're doing college. What's next? What's next for I don't know, for real you? life, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Teddy, can, can you tell us a little bit about Teddy? Um, uh, you know what, Teddy is, he's really unique. He, he's just a diehard believer in sort of his fraternity and the brotherhood and what it stands for. And he's really hanging on to this last moment, you know, of this life where he gets to be free and, and sort of party as he wants and rule this gang. And, um, it's kind of neat because he's like a, he's sort of like a Faganistic type character. He takes these guys under his wing and, and uh, I don't know. I just I just knew this guy so I was really excited to play him. He's he's also crazy. All right, I just I'm just don't know how I feel about Dave Franco. What do you mean? Are you not telling me you don't get those creepy vibes? Oh, oh I do. He's a creep for sure, but it's part of what fascinates me about him. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, anyways, uh, sneak peekers, stay around because we'll be right back after this commercial break. Welcome back, fellow viewers. Oh, Rachel, you beautiful talented host. Do you know what I miss most about Parks and Rec? It's quotability, characters. No, uh, no uh, DJ Roomba and Champion the Three-Legged Dog. <laughs> well, don't be sad because up next we have Derek, no excuse me, you're Derek. We have Shane and Kim with our, with our list of the week to tell us what their favorites were about Parks and Rec. Let us reminisce together. On February 24th, TV lost one of its great comedies. For seven seasons, Parks and Recreation Rest in peace. has given us a new perspective on life. To show our respects to the NBC hit show, we have compiled a list of the best moments from the show. Spoiler alert, obviously. Let's start off with a highlight from the season two episode, Telethon. In this episode, Leslie, played by Amy Poehler, has to naturally run a telethon during the graveyard shift. In order to stay moving, she consumes Candy Company Sweetums' new Nutrium bars not knowing what's in them. Frankly, she doesn't care. However, Anne, played by Rashida Jones, is quick to reveal that Nutriums are literally just bars of sugar. This leads Leslie to slam herself against a window in a fit of sugary excitement to try and scare Anne. It's hard to convey the brilliance of this moment with just a photo, but trust me, it's truly fantastic. In the episode Ron and Tammy, we are introduced to one of my favorite secondary characters of all time, Tammy Too. Tammy Too, played by Nick Offerman's real life wife, Megan Mullally, plays Ron Swanson's psycho, sex-crazed ex-wife, in the episodes, Tammy approaches Leslie pretending to want to settle the differences between her and Ron. In reality, she just wants Ron to give her the lot that Leslie wants to turn into a park. Even though Ron falls for Tammy 2's trap, he quickly realizes he's being manipulated and learns to resist her so-called charm. There are a lot of crazies in the city of Pawnee, but Tammy 2 takes the cake, and she never disappoints when she comes back to ruin Ron's life. Next is a bottle episode that came to us in the final farewell season. Leslie and Ron dealt with tensions that the two co-workers had been facing since the beginning of the season. Leslie believes that Ron simply wrote her off by building his office building and bulldozing Anne's former house in the process, but there's a lot more to it than that. I won't go into too much detail, but let's just say this episode really gave viewers insight into Ron as a human being reacting to all the major changes that are occurring around him. It also solidifies, solidifies Leslie and Ron as one of the best platonic relationships I've ever seen on television. Also, saxophone farts. Parks and Rec had, had quite a few political cameos. First, Lady Michelle Obama told Leslie that she needed passionate people like her in the office in the season six finale, Moving Up. 
I literally died and went to heaven after seeing the interaction between Michelle and Leslie. She was starstruck, embarrassing, and still perfect. Nope, in Obama 2016, y'all. There was also VP Joe Biden in season 5's Leslie vs. April, when Ben gives Leslie the engagement gift of a lifetime, meeting her celebrity crush and hero, Biden. Biden compliments Leslie on the, all the hard work she's done for Indiana, which makes Leslie frown girl and start to creepily touch his face and pull him close to her. Ben, as any good fiancé would do, pulls away a very giggly and starstruck Leslie before she gets a restraining order. Joe Biden, you the real MVP. All good things must come to an end. This sadly proved true when in season six, regular cast members Rashida Jones and Rob Lowe exited Parks and Rec in the episode Ann and Chris. Ann and Leslie's friendship was the original drive of the series, and to see these besties separated was heart-wrenching. That's not even mentioning the perpetual ray of sunshine that is Chris Traeger. This is literally one of the most emotional episodes of the show and a wonderful send-off, though not a final goodbye, to two great characters. What a beautiful tropical fish. Andy and April. April and Andy. I never would have thought these two would end up together, yet I like them. I like them so much. The season two finale, Freddy Spaghetti, Andy and April finally kiss. Even though the aftermath of that kiss was not great, they end up dating and eventually getting married. They're an odd couple, but they're two of my favorite people to watch on screen. I'm just going to miss those crazy kids. Snake juice. Just snake juice. Tom Haverford, played by Aziz Ansari, seems to always have a new product idea every episode. In season three's The Fights, every member of the Parks and Rec department becomes exceedingly drunk due to the high alcohol content of Tom's newest drink invention, snake juice. Described as basically rat poison, we get to see what every single core cast member is like when they're severely intoxicated. It's amazing to say, to say, to say the least, from April's unintelligible Spanish babbling to Ron's unnaturally joyful boogieing. Lest we forget Ben, who simply utters one word, Baba Booey. Perfect. Leslie and Ben have always been my OTP, or one true pairing for you uncool kids, since Ben moved to Pawnee. He's super dorky, cute, and he and Leslie have amazing chemistry. In the episode Road Trip, I kept biting my nails wondering if they will or will not end up together. As the episode rolled on, my heart just kept beating faster and faster into the ending when Leslie and Ben finally kissed. That was the start of one of the cutest and best television couples in television history. For our number two spot, we have what is one of the best instances of physical comedy on Parks and Rec and any show ever. In season four's comeback, I mean, in season four's episode, The Comeback Kid, Leslie faces an immediate problem when April accidentally schedules her to appear at an ice rink in her campaign for a council seat. Piling on, Tom is only able to get red carpet for half of the trek across the rink to the podium for Leslie. This leads to the entire group shuffling across the ice as the off-screen rink DJ keeps repeating a rousing song that belts, get on your feet, as everyone falls, slips, and slides about. It all culminates in everyone pushing Leslie up onto the podium, looking, as series co-creator Michael Schur accurately describes, like the Iwo Jima statue. It really is brilliant all around, with every part working together to create a true comedy masterpiece of a scene. Clothes. Treat yourself. Fragrances. Treat yourself. Massages. Treat yourself. Mimosas. Treat yourself. Fine leather goods. Treat yourself. Thank you, Tom and Donna, for introducing me to my life motto, Treat Yourself. In the episode Pawnee Rangers, Tom and Donna invite Ben to their annual Treat Yourself spa and shopping trip after his breakup with Leslie. That's also when we learn the beauty of the phrase, Treat Yourself. Tom and Donna teach us that there's nothing wrong with wanting to buy yourself something really nice. So if you ever feel down in the dumps, treat yourself because you deserve it. Make Tom and Donna proud. In conclusion, we will sorely miss you, Parks and Recreation. Like Lil Sebastian, you're 5,000 candles in the wind. Back to you, Derek and Rachel. Oof, Parks and Rec got me in my feels. Me too. I It was a great show to binge watch today during our snow day. Speaking of what's up with the cold, it was just in the 70s yesterday. I know, I was wearing flip flops yesterday and then I had to wear a scarf and mittens and a beanie to get to the studio today. Well, while you're bundled up during this cold, warm, bipolar Texas weather, we have our own Chelsea Pena to show us what you should be watching on your television. Today, we, the students of the University of Texas and students from other respectable school districts, had canceled classes because of a snowstorm. The city naturally prepared as if something like this were to happen. People took to Twitter to express their relief. Some people were happy to get the day off to be productive or see their girlfriends. But most of all, the internet was filled with trolls calling out UT on the so-called snow day. In honor of this cold, snowless, iceless, cleared, skied, suns out, guns out, snow day, we have put together a list of our favorite cold, snowy movies. 
First on this list is maybe the most obvious one. Snow Day takes us inside of a small town snow day. Filled with sledding, snowball fights, an evil snow plowing man, and a hopeless romantic trying to win over his one true love. Snow Day reminds you of how much joy you get from school getting canceled and how that level of joy stays the same throughout all of your schooling career. Another cold, wintry favorite is Snow Dogs. A stuck up hotshot dentist has to travel to a snowy tundra. There he finds some unlikely friends a group of dogs, the Snow Dogs. Together with their differing personalities, they mush through the hills. After seeing this movie, you'll have the husky puppy fever if you didn't already have it before. To shift away from comedy movies, we add The Day After Tomorrow to the list. The dreamy Jake Gyllenhaal is in the city of New York with the rest of his scholars as a mean and fatal storm blows in. This movie, created to cultivate awareness on global warming, what's up Al Gore, takes us inside the frozen city. Complete with frozen buildings, freezing temperatures, and vicious sled dogs. Completely unrelated to the previously mentioned dogs though, this movie makes you want to bundle up and jump the bones of Jake Gyllenhaal all at the same time. As much as it pains me to mention this, topping off the bottom of our list is of course Frozen. A magic kingdom frozen under ice because of an unfortunate curse, two princesses, one of which just wants to build a snowman and the other just trying to survive. When the Ice Queen runs away from her ice palace, it's up to the other girl in this movie to save the day. A very Disney premise. Complete with a love affair, of course, reindeer, ice picking, snowman, and a very catchy song that I just couldn't let go. Until I heard this version. Well now they know, let me poop, let me poop, can't hold it in anymore. Let me poop, let me poop, I should have closed the door. I'm much more into Emily's version. With that being said, that's all for our lineup tonight. Stay warm. Back to you guys. Let it go. Let Queen it go. Enough, enough. I am so done with that song. Okay, Derek, I know it's overplayed, but it's still such a great song. Okay. Don't okay me. While I convince Derek the glory that is Frozen, we're gonna take this commercial break. You can try. We'll be right back. Life is so beautiful, isn't it, Derek? Yeah, but why so happy, Rachel? Well, Derek, I just got done watching all four seasons of American Horror Story, and let me tell you, I'm in love with Evan Peters. Why, he was horrible in X-Men, and now he's doing more horror in the movie Lazarus Effect, which Alex just so happens to be reviewing in a second. Well, what are we waiting for? Alex, take it away. Hi, Alex here. More often than not, moviegoers tend to give a pass on horror films that fall short in quality, but provide a good scare. The Lazarus Effect sadly falls on both fronts. Under the direction of David Gelb, the film manages to impress audiences with decent visuals and production design, but is unable to conjure up any frightening moments or a conclusion that masks its empty plot. Empty plot. Sorry. <laughs> Marketed as a production from the makers of Paranormal, Activity, and Insidious, it was a reasonable bet to believe the Lazarus Effect would be a somewhat functional tale with cheap scares that have admirable execution. But neither are present as we follow a relaxed group of researchers who attempt to bring back the dead back through science. Upon a somewhat successful revival of a previously deceased dog, the team prepares to reveal their discovery to the world, but things get seriously complicated when they are forced to shut their project down before getting to properly celebrate. 
The synopsis of this story unfortunately proves to be the most exciting facet since the writers fail to do it justice when combining theories of religion with biological science, a line that gets clearly lost in the events of the film. The nature of the setting presents ideas of a science fiction horror with conv convoluted scientific vocabulary that is supposed to confuse the audience more than makes sense. But that gets quickly thrown in the trash as the writers begin to toss up unsystematic questions regarding the afterlife and consequences of the evil doings. There's also the exploration of Wilde's character and her background as a large building point that never pays off. This is evident through an elaborate reveal that feels more desperate than anything else, along with the lack of invention to provide any actual scares that are unpredictable. These elements doom the commendable efforts of the film, although there are a few to begin with. <laughs> The performances were acceptable given the stock characters the actors were provided with. Duplass does his best to portray an ambitious scientist but falls short in making the viewers care for the losses his character experiences throughout. Wilde delivers a respectable performance when the events turn and is able to show a dynamic range of skills through the more interesting situation presented to her character. Overall, The Lazarus Effect is a muddled mess with fizzles in originality, but holds some ground in its technical aspects and a strong performance from Olivia Wilde. Exertions are made to close out its third act with an interesting ending, but instead makes the audience say, uh, wait, wait, what? <laughs> and for these reasons, I give it a one of five stars. The movie just doesn't work. Fortunately, the director graces the viewers with a short runtime of 90 minutes. Back to you guys. So Derek, do you have any plans for South by Southwest? Definitely. I've got a plan. I know exactly what movies, parties, concerts to hit. Nice. Okay, any movie recommendations? Uh, Trainwreck with Amy Schumer. It's a Judd Apatow film, so you know it'll be funny. I like it. All right, that's a good, that's a good one. I mean, I could show you the trailer right now. Oh, let's do it. Let's, let's roll, roll it. it. Girls, your mother and I are getting divorced. Monogamy isn't realistic. Monogamy isn't realistic. Again. Monogamy isn't realistic. I didn't understand that word at the time, but now I know exactly what he was talking about. Saturday, I would love it if you were my date. I can't do that because, like, you and I won't ever see each other again. I wake up late every morning, manager's calling, I'm still oh. yawning. Good morning. Oh, Amy. What happened? Did church let out early? Uh, 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 oh, I like Tom's sweater. Does he teach computer in a church basement? Well, don't get all threatened just because you don't understand the concept of marriage. You dress him like that so nobody else wants to have sex with him. That's cool. Hey! Oh, no, I was drunk last night. I was so kicking in. I don't feel right. I'm just a modern chick who does what she wants. Last week, it was this guy. Is that one in the box? Hey, Mark Wahlberg. Shut up. Mark Wahlberg? Mark Wahlberg's like 150 pounds. I look like Mark Wahlberg ate Mark Wahlberg. Before you judge, you should know I'm doing fine. My friends are awesome, my apartment's sick, and I have a great job at a men's magazine. I like you, Amy. You're clever, but you're not too brainy. You're pretty-ish, and you're not gorgeous. You're approachable. Thank you. Yeah. I'm giving you an assignment. I need a profile on a sports doctor. So you're doing the article on me? Mm-hmm. Sorry to interrupt. We watching Downton Abbey later? LeBron, I'm being interviewed. Listen, I'm watching it tonight because I'm not going to go to practice and all the guys are talking about it and I'm left out. Tall. Oh. You follow sports? Sports. I love them. Who's your favorite team? The Orlando Blooms. Do you want to get a drink? Yeah. What am I doing? I slept at the doctor's place last night. My boy got intimate. Yes. Sexual intercourse. Oh! You never spend the night. What were you, blackout drunk? No, I had like two drinks. Three, max. Four, now that I'm tallying. Because you're on antibiotics or something? Oh my god, he's calling me. Why would he call you guys just had sex? This is Amy. I think you butt dialed me. No, I dialed you with my fingers. What'd she say? What'd she say? He called me on purpose. Hang up. He's obviously like sick or something. <laughs> I was calling to say I had a really good time last night. I was wondering if you wanted to um, hang out again. I'm gonna call the police. Are you ready? Are you ready? 
Wow, what a great movie. I know, I, I can't wait to see it. Well, you're gonna have to. It doesn't air until summertime. That's a long ways away. What will I do until then? I know, well until then, you're just gonna have to tune in every Thursday night at 9.30 to watch Sneak Peek. Until next time, I'm Rachel Robillard. And I'm Derek Beckman.